Well, this morning we are continuing in John's Gospel. We're actually today going to finish um, finish this Gospel. Uh, I think we ended up with, uh, I think it was um, 97 or 98 uh, sermons or times uh, in this word. And oddly enough, uh, that's actually quite small. It's quite a small number for a book of this size. But it's because oftentimes there were big sections that just dealt with one issue. But, and, but again, sometimes there are sections that say relatively little but have a lot of meaning. And uh, that's what we actually come to this morning as we look at verses 20 through 23. So let me go ahead and read that as we begin. I've already told you what the theme of this particular section is. It, it does have many themes, or at least a few here. But um, the important thing is that we pay attention to the words of our Lord Jesus. We need to understand what he says. And we see, in a, again, a great example of what can happen if we don't pay attention to the words. So first of all, let's read it. We read in beginning in verse 20. And this follows, again, from uh, Jesus' prediction of Peter's death, what kind of death by which he was going to glorify the Lord, and his command to Peter to get up and to follow him. And of course, Peter got up and began to follow him. This is what we see next. Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following him, the one who also had leaned back on his bosom at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? So Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, and what about this man? Jesus said to him, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Therefore, this saying went out among the brethren that that disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but only if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? May the Lord bless his word again to our hearing this morning. Now, last week, again, I'll just remind you because it is so encouraging. We saw Jesus restore Peter after his denials to remind us that there are second chances in God's kingdom. Actually, there's more than, than just one or two. There are many. He will forgive us. He will still use us even when we fall into sin. When we repent, and thankfully, by God's grace, we will repent because the Lord will make sure that we never fall away from him entirely. Now, we also saw that after Jesus restored Peter, he renewed his call to him as an apostle and even revealed to him the kind of death by which he would die to honor his Lord. Jesus said to Peter, you will live to a good old age, but you will not die a natural death. Your life would be cut short by martyrdom. Now, church history tells us, remember, at least church tradition, and then, you know, when you get really far back there, uh, it does tend to be more of a tradition than history, but yet it was written down. Many believe that this actually happened, that what Jesus said regarding Peter came to pass, that he was martyred, and certainly we, we know that he died in some way, and that it was martyrdom, but again, this specific way that Peter died. Martyrdom at Rome being crucified upside down because of his faith in our Lord Jesus. Remember when it came time for Peter to die and they, he knew he was going to be crucified. He said, I'm, I'm not worthy to die as my Lord died. Don't crucify me right side up. Crucify me upside down. And they did for, again, uh, they wanted to, of course, put Peter to death because they consider him a criminal. But Peter died for the honor of his Lord, sealing his testimony with his blood. Now, this morning we see that, that John obviously heard what Jesus had said to Peter. After all, he did say it in that group. It was before uh, Jesus called Peter apart. But hearing what Jesus said to Peter and realizing that Jesus knew the future appears to have made him curious about his end. Hey, Jesus knew what was going to happen to Peter. He must know what's going to happen to me. And so when Jesus asked Peter to follow him, they get up and begin to walk away. He gets up as well and begins to follow Jesus and Peter, hoping that Jesus might also reveal his end. Now, John did find out something about it, but he also found out that what Jesus said could be easily misunderstood. 
which again reminds us that we always need to pay careful attention to what the scripture actually says and not to what we want it to say if we are going to stay in the path of safety. Now this morning what I'd like us to do is look at three things. First of all, John's interest in knowing his future, which is vocalized in Peter's question. Secondly, Jesus' response to Peter's question. And then thirdly, the misunderstanding that arose from Jesus' response. So first of all, we see that John also appears to have had an interest in knowing what the future actually held for him. We read in verse 20, Peter turning around saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who also had leaned back on his bosom at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Now, I already told you that Jesus had told Peter that he needed to follow him, and so he got up and began to follow. Again, just thinking about this from Peter's perspective, being thankful that he still could follow Jesus and that Jesus wasn't going to set him aside or cast him away because of his grace and of his mercy. But what is it that Jesus wanted? You know, why did he ask Peter to get up and follow him? Well, I had always assumed it was because he was calling Peter to you know, go now get busy and begin to do the work, and he was setting him apart as though he should follow Jesus and the rest, perhaps it wasn't time for them yet, they, they could just stay. But we do need to understand that this was not the last time that Jesus would appear to his disciples. Peter was not leaving to go somewhere else. Jesus was not calling him to do something separate. They would all remain together until Jesus ascended. And then they would all wait together and pray together in the upper room until the Spirit of God descended on the day of Pentecost. In other words, Jesus was not at that time calling Peter apart to do something, as it were, unique, something special. So what is it that Jesus wanted from Peter? Well, I think it's likely that he just simply wanted to talk with him further apart from the rest of the disciples about what exactly we, we really don't know. But this is the important part. As Jesus, or excuse me, as Peter begins to follow him, he turns around and he sees the disciple Jesus loved following. Now remember, that's John. That's how John has described himself throughout his gospel. He never names himself, and we don't know why he doesn't, although it is interesting the other gospel writers don't actually name themselves in their gospels either. But yet John describes himself in such a way, not only that we would know who he was, but also so that we would know why he followed Jesus. And the reason he followed Jesus was because Jesus loved him. Now that, that's an interesting thing because why does John use that description only of himself and, and not of the other disciples? Does John mean that Jesus somehow loved him more than the others? Well, we explored that not too long ago in the Gospel of John and we did see that Jesus did in fact have his favorites he had his inner circle, uh, those that he allowed to go with him on certain occasions when the others were essentially excluded. And even in the garden, he had his favorites that sort of you know, took them apart and then he went beyond them. So yes, he did have his favorites. Maybe he meant that. Did he mean that Jesus was showing more love to him than he showed to the others? Well, it's, again, it's true that the Lord seemed to do that by setting him apart in his circle of inner friends. And he was also the one who was allowed to lean against Jesus at the Last Supper. There was a certain kind of closeness there between John and Jesus. Or maybe John simply meant that Jesus loved him along with the other ten disciples. Remember, excluding Judas because he was the traitor, the one who betrayed Jesus. And he was simply overwhelmed by the fact that Jesus could love somebody like him that he would love him enough to lay down his life for him, as the table reminds us of this morning, and that he would take up his life again in order that he might save him. Well, again, any one of these reasons might explain why John was following Jesus because 
Jesus loved John, and John loved Jesus, and he wanted to be near Jesus. And it could explain why he was following Jesus and Peter when they got up, even though Jesus only asked Peter to follow him. But I think it's also possible that John wanted to know something about his future, uh, what Jesus had to say about what he would do and how he would die, just as he had told Peter. And I think this is the way that Peter seems to understand John's desire when he sees him following. Now, we need to understand John is the one who is writing this gospel, and John uh, is the one who brought up this, this picture again of him leaning against Jesus, reclining against him, as it were, at the Last Supper, what he had done at the, at the supper. And perhaps he did that to explain why Peter accommodates John as he does Next, we read in verse 21. So Peter, seeing him, seeing John following, said to Jesus, Lord, and what about this man? Uh, Peter here is literally asking, Lord, in, in this it's sort of an abbreviated way in the original language. He doesn't actually specify what he's asking, but he literally says this, Lord, to this man, what? Which could mean, what do you want him to do? Or it could mean, what's going to happen to him? Or more likely, Peter was asking Jesus both. Lord, you've just told me what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to feed your sheep. And you told me what's going to happen to me. One day when I grow old, I'm going to stretch out my hands and I'm going to be carried where I don't want to go. Jesus, what do you want him to do? What's going to happen to him in the future? Now, Remember that, again, John brought up this, this, um, this memory of, of um, his reclining against Jesus at the Last Supper. And what is it that happened at that particular time? Well, remember, Jesus had just said somebody was going to betray him, and it was going to be one of those seated at the table with him. And Peter was wondering, well, who could it be? And they're all asking themselves this question, is it me, is it me, Lord? Well, Peter sees John reclining against Jesus at the table, and he says, hey, John, ask Jesus, who is it? And John does, and Jesus answers, and apparently that message doesn't get through to Peter, but he still did what Peter asked him, and it's possible that he, having now done that for Peter, Peter wants to repay that kindness to John now that he was in a position, as it were, to help John since he had been called to walk with Jesus, he seems perhaps to have felt an obligation to ask Jesus on John's behalf, since John appeared to want to know as well what Jesus had planned for him. In other words, <clears throat> Peter understood what John wanted and why he was following, and because John had done him this favor, Peter is asking now Jesus on John's behalf, Lord, what about this man? Now, I think we would all certainly like to know the answer to that question ourselves, wouldn't we? With regard to what the Lord has planned for us. We all want to know what the Lord wants us to do with our lives, particularly if we love Him and want to honor Him. We want to know how the Lord intends to use us. We want to be used. Lord, how are you going to use me? I think we'd also all like to know what's going to happen to us in the future. Now, we, we need to understand the Lord has actually told us the answers to all of these questions. He hasn't perhaps given us the specifics as he did to Peter. But we do know what it is the Lord wants us to do. That's why he gave us his word. We know how he wants to use us. He also tells us that in his word. We also know what he has planned for us in the future. If we trust him, if we follow him, we will one day be with him in heaven. Like I said, we don't have the specifics. We don't know precisely what he wants us to do uh, with regard to our lives, our vocation. We don't know exactly how we're going to die, but we do have the important parts. We know how to do what the Lord has called us to do in his word. We do know that his intention for us is that we devote our lives completely to his glory. And we do know that if by his grace we're able to do this, the Lord is going to take us to be with him forever in heaven. We do have the answers to the most important parts of these questions. 
Now, this also shows us that Peter was concerned about John. He cared about him. He cared about what happened to him. And what Peter was actually doing for John here was that he was praying. Because what is prayer except asking Jesus or, or talking to Jesus? That's what Peter was doing. He was talking to Jesus. He just happened to be here on the earth instead of in heaven. It's still prayer. When, when Peter saw Jesus walking on the water and he said, Lord, if that's really you, command me to come out to you. And Jesus said, come. And he began to walk out to him. And then he begins to look at what's going on around him and realizes he's standing on the water. He begins to sink. And he prays out, Lord, help. What was he doing? But praying to the Lord for his help. So Peter was praying for John. And that's what the Lord wants us, of course, to do. He wants us to pray for one another. He wants us to be concerned for one another. He wants us to take the concerns that we have for one another to the throne of grace. That's what the church has historically called the communion of saints, that we have communion with one another in our gifts and graces. But that sounds rather abstract and kind of out there somewhere. What it means is that we're one body in the Lord Jesus Christ. And because we are, we are to love one another and be concerned for one another as though we are members of one family because as a matter of fact, we are members of one family. We should love one another as we do the members of our own household. And Jesus said on some occasions when we have unbelieving members of our household, we should actually love one another even more than we love our own natural families. Now, second, we see how Jesus responds to Peter's question. And here's another interesting thing that tells us a couple of things. We read in verse 22. Jesus said to him, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Now, it does seem by the way that Jesus responds to Peter that Peter's actually asking the wrong question. Uh, Jesus was looking for Peter to say something else. When he said to, to him, follow me, he should have been asking the question, Lord, what can I do to carry out your will? How can I faithfully endure the trial that you've just told me about that's coming? Lord, give me faith, strengthen my faith so that I'll be able to endure it. But instead of asking those questions, Peter was asking what John should be doing and what was going to happen to him. Now, we've just seen that it's all right to be concerned for one another and pray for one another. That's what we need to be doing. That's what Jesus wants us to do. But there are certain things that he doesn't want us necessarily to know about others or be concerned about, things that he has reserved for himself. And yet, in his answer, he does seem to give at least a partial answer to the question, at least with regard to what's going to happen to John in the future. He says, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? Now, he seems to imply that John was not going to die the same kind of death that Peter was going to die. He wasn't going to die a martyr's death, but he would remain until Jesus came. Now, church tradition tells us that John was the only apostle that wasn't martyred for his faith. He had to face many dangers. He was often imprisoned. We know he was even banished. But John actually finally died in, in an old age in his bed. He didn't die a martyr's death. Now, everyone who follows Jesus, as we've already read, as Paul wrote to Timothy, must expect difficulties, must expect persecutions. But as we've already seen, not everyone is going to face martyrdom. It's an honor when the Lord calls us to die for him. But if he doesn't call us to that particular honor, we can still honor the Lord in other ways, such as using the extra time that he gives us to serve him in his kingdom. You know, I, I was thinking about Paul's desire to depart from this life and to be with Christ as he ex expresses it in Philippians 1. And the question often came to mind, why would Paul, if he had a choice, why would he rather die and be with Christ instead of staying on and continuing to labor for him, knowing that he's eventually going to be with Jesus anyway? And if he were able to stay, he could store up more treasures in heaven. Well, it's because of the kind of death that Paul was going to die. It's not just because he wanted to drop dead, but because he was facing martyrdom. He was in prison. 
It, it was possible that he was going to have to give his life, and that would be better. And if he should die that kind of life, he would immediately be with the Lord, and that would be very much better. I don't think Paul had just simply a death wish, but he wanted to honor the Lord, whether by his life or by his death. But if he could honor him in his death, that would mean he would be with the Lord much more quickly. And I think it, we also have to assume that dying a martyr's death is something that is so great of an honor that it makes up for all that time you might have lived beyond that serving your Lord. It is the most powerful testimony that you can possibly give to the truth of the gospel. So whether the Lord gives us that honor or whether he spares our lives to, to live longer, we should be using that time to serve and honor him in any way that we can. But do we do need to ask the question, what does Jesus mean when he says that John will remain until he comes? Is he talking about uh, his coming for John in, in death? Because scripture sometimes uh, represents the Lord coming in, in that way. He comes for each of his saints, although maybe not personally when they die. He sends his angels, but he's, he's represented as coming to them in order to take them to heaven. Is that, is that what he means? That, that's possible. Was Jesus referring to his second coming when he would come to raise the dead and gather all the living together for the final judgment? Is he saying that John would never die until Jesus actually comes in his second death? Well, we know he doesn't mean that because in the next verse, John is specifically going to deny that Jesus meant that. Well, did Jesus mean that John wouldn't die until he came in judgment against Jerusalem in 70 AD? That coming that he was referring to in, in Matthew chapter 24, when he comes in the clouds of heaven and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him? Well, that is certainly possible because all the other apostles were actually dead by that time, but John was the only one who survived. He was alive in 70 AD and he was alive after 70 AD. John was that particular apostle that was given the honor by the Lord Jesus of closing the canon, which is just simply a technical way of saying that he completed the scriptures. He was the one who wrote the very last scripture and who closed the very last words that he, that he wrote. It was actually a canonical curse, which we see in the Old Testament as well, which is a warning against adding to or taking away from the words of scripture. John was given the honor of staying until the scripture was complete. John was also given the honor of confronting some of the earlier heretics that, that rose up in the church, such as Serenthus, who was basically an early Gnostic, and Gnostics were the ones that believed that um, uh, basically the God who made the world was an emanation from this, this sort of uh, origin or source of all being that sort of by nature spews out his being. and as it's spewed out, it creates these lesser deities, so to speak, and eventually, as you get further and further away from the one, and the one in their estimation is not God, you end up with the God of the Bible who creates the material universe. They deny that the one who is God could have created the material universe, at least the one could have, they believe this emanation could do it, because material things are evil and only spiritual things are good. Gnostics believe that the Christ actually came upon Jesus at his baptism, but then left Jesus at, at the cross after he had guided him through his entire ministry. It was, it was heresy. And John, on one occasion, I guess was, he was in this particular area. It was like a public bath. And when he was in there, he saw Serenthus come in. And he said, let's get out of here because God might tear this building down on top of Serenthus' head. So... Serenthus was, was, an evil, was an evil man, and John had to withstand him. He also confronted the, another early heresy called that of the Ebionites, who believed that Jesus was the Messiah, but they denied his deity. And they embraced the law of God like the Judaizers, believing that it was necessary. So they followed the Jewish law, and they followed the ceremonies. They admired James, the brother of the Lord, who wrote the, the letter of James, but they didn't like Paul. They considered him to be an apostate because of his emphasis on grace. Well, again, another heresy. They, they believed that they were made righteous through their obedience and through their law-keeping, and John was there to withstand that. Now, Jesus could have meant, probably meant, at least this much. 
when he said what he said. So John got a little bit of a glimpse into the future, and he saw something of what was going to happen to him. But then when Jesus said that, he also said to Peter, but what is that to you, Peter? And this appears to be a mild rebuke, at least, to Peter's question. Why are you asking me what I have secretly planned for John? Now, because of this, some believe that his comment about John remaining was purely hypothetical. If I want him never to die, that's no concern of yours. I've told you how you are to die. I've told you what you need to do, and that should be enough for you. Now, we do need to see here at least something of what Jesus is saying, and that is that we shouldn't be too concerned about things that really don't have to do with us. Sometimes, I think actually most of the time, if not all times, Jesus wants us to mind our own business, at least when it comes to certain things, not everything. I mean, we do need to, of course, observe what our brethren are doing. If we see them in sin, we need to try to recover them and things of that nature. But there are certain things we're not supposed to pay attention to. For one thing, what the Lord has secretly planned for them. That's really none of our business. The secret things belong to the Lord, Moses wrote. But the things revealed belong to us. We're not supposed to be curious even what, with what God has in his secret plan for ourselves. And if not for ourselves, certainly not for others. Instead, the Lord wants us to focus on what it is we know he wants us to be doing, to concern ourselves with what he has told us is our duty each day and not worry about the things of tomorrow. Remember how Jesus said on one occasion, you know, each day has enough trouble of its own. Focus on the things of today. Stop worrying about what comes tomorrow. We are simply to follow our Lord Jesus wherever he calls us. And by the way, Scripture also reminds us with regard to our brethren that we're not supposed to be judging our brothers or sisters on matters of Christian liberty. To their own master, they stand or fall. Now, if we paid it more attention to our own business in doing what the Lord calls us to do, perhaps we wouldn't find as much time to be concerned about other people's business. Now, we do need to be concerned for their well-being, as I've said, and we do need to be concerned if we see them fall into sin. But the Lord has not called us, as it were, to, to be the caretaker of our brethren. We do need to let them walk before the Lord as the Lord has called them. And so I think that's what Jesus was saying to Peter. Don't, don't be concerned about John, Peter. Be concerned about what I'm saying to you now, what I want you to do now. You follow me. Now, finally, we see the mistake that arose because of Jesus' statement in verse 23. Therefore, this saying went out among the brethren that that disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but only if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? Now, by the time John wrote his, his gospel, what Jesus had said about John had been told to others. This saying went out. And they concluded that John, that what Jesus was saying was that John would not die, that John would live to the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, maybe they chose to believe this because that's what they wanted to believe. It's an old saying, we believe what we wish to be true. Have you ever noticed that that, that happens? You know, we, we oftentimes when we come to Scripture, what does the Scripture say about something? And you have this preconceived idea of what it says, and when you go into the Word of God, you actually find it. You find what you believed, you see. But too often, we actually do that. We're, we're reading our views into the Scripture, and we have to be careful not to do that. We need to let the Scripture speak for itself. Apparently, there were a lot of people who loved John, and they didn't want John to die. If John never died, what a great blessing that would be for the church. In every age, there would be an apostle, somebody who heard the words of Jesus, somebody who was endowed with the Spirit and knew exactly what Jesus meant in everything that he said. Wouldn't it be? We, we think that would be a wonderful thing to have, an infallible interpreter, an immortal interpreter. Now, as much as we might like to have that, 
we do need to understand that we don't need, we don't need that because Jesus has given us His Word. He did leave John to close the canon, as it were, to complete the Scriptures, but once the, the Scriptures were complete, we have everything we need. We have an infallible rule of faith and practice, and we also have God's Spirit to help us understand it and to help us apply it and to help us do it. The Lord has also appointed in His church teachers to guide His people in the truth, but no infallible teachers. You know, we have to make sure even when we're taught that what we're being taught is coming out of the Word of God. We do not need an immortal instructor. We don't need an infallible instructor. If we did, the Lord would have given us one. Instead, what He gave us was an infallible Word, and He gave us His Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus did not say that John would never die. I want you to notice that. This false belief started from misunderstanding of what Jesus actually said, which is why we need to be careful about building our belief system on basically hearsay or on majority interpretation, what people are saying, traditions, even traditions that come as early as apostolic times. I mean, this was a very early tradition or belief that, that arose in the church. It was early, it was public, there were many people who held it, but the problem with it was it wasn't true. It didn't agree with what Jesus actually said. So we need to guard ourselves against basing belief on things that are unwritten, on the writings of men, on the beliefs of men, on the interpretations of men. Uh, we need to be careful not even not to, um, as it were, base our beliefs on what the early church believed. I mean, here's a belief that rose up in the early church, but it was clearly wrong when it was brought to the Scripture itself what Jesus actually said. That's what John points to. That's, Jesus didn't tell me that. He didn't say I wasn't going to die. But this is what he said, and that's not what he meant. We need to let the Scripture interpret and explain itself. You know, it is very easy to misunderstand the Scriptures. We need to make sure that we guard ourselves against it. The first meaning that pops out to us when we read the Scripture is not always what it necessarily means. It isn't always right. We need to read it. We need to study it until we understand it. We need to compare Scripture with Scripture. Now, again, we can use teachers. We can use the history of interpretation as a guide. I mean, in, in this particular church, we have a confession, and that confession is basically a, a systematic understanding of the Bible, and we believe it's true. But we don't believe it's true because men said it, but because we've taken it to the Scriptures, and we believe that that is, in fact, what the Scripture says. We have a whole history of interpretation that we can learn from, but we always need to make sure that what we listen to is squarely based on the Word of God. We always need to let the Scriptures speak for themselves and interpret itself. What it says is so important in every area, particularly when it comes to the Gospel, because if we get that wrong, we might say, well, the Bible says a lot of things. It doesn't matter whether I believe this or that. It doesn't matter whether I believe that I'm saved by my works. If I'm just good enough by keeping the law, it doesn't matter. It does matter. Paul says if, if you believe that, you're, you're under the curse still. You haven't been saved. You've fallen from, from grace. The principle of grace, we are saved by grace through faith alone. That's what the Bible teaches. If we believe something else, it makes a difference. It could condemn us forever. We have to listen to what the Bible says regarding faith in the Lord Jesus. We have to trust Him. We have to trust Him alone. We have to believe what the Bible says regarding repentance. We can't keep our sins and come to Jesus. We have to turn away from them, and we have to do what is right. We must follow Him, but not just in any way, but in the way that the Lord tells us to follow Him. We must walk in the good, straight, and right path, in the path of duty, if we are to be on the safe path, you see there's only one 
safe path, and that is the one that the Scripture tells us of. And that is when you understand it the way that the Lord actually intended and not just simply the way that you think, you know, what you think it might mean or what you would like it to mean. So to clear up this misunderstanding, John points to the words Jesus spoke to show that it was simply a misunderstanding. Verse 23, Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but only if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? We need to listen to Jesus and not force any meaning on his words that aren't in his words. We need to pay attention to that canonical curse I was telling you about at the end of the book of Revelation where John says, basically, if anyone adds to these words, God will add to him the curses that are in this book. If anyone takes a word away from these words, the Lord will take away him from the book of life. You don't want either of those things to happen. But that applies to all of Scripture. So don't add to or take away, but, but listen to what the Scripture says and walk in the safe path, the path the Scripture lays before us because it's in doing that by embracing the Lord Jesus Christ and walking in His paths that you can know that the blessings that are actually uh, represented by this table here this morning, the, the broken body of Christ, the shed blood of Christ, that those things actually apply to you, that Jesus actually did those things for you, that you are saved and you will see heaven. You can also know that you are living a life that is pleasing to God and are honoring Him by what you do. And the only way you can know is through the Word of God. You know, the Scripture actually says that if you don't know that, that whether this thing is good or bad, and it may be bad, you're suspecting it may be bad, but you're not convinced it isn't and you do it, that you're still sinning. Whatever is not of faith is sin. We need to make sure that we base whatever we do on the Word of God. You know, the, um, uh, the Reformers, at least um, a majority of them, uh, believed that it was very important that what we do in worship is only that which the Lord commands. We call that the regulative principle, uh, the idea that God wants to be worshipped in a particular way, and so that's the way we do it because we want to honor Him, but that's also what pleases Him, so we do it that way. Uh, that regulative principle doesn't apply just to the worship we do here, but it applies to everything we do. Whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, we are to do it all for the glory of, of God. So we need to make sure that the things we're thinking, the things we're desiring, the words we're saying, the actions we speak are all what the Lord wants us to be doing. Every decision we make is the decision He wants us to make. That is the goal. That is what it means to devote ourselves to Him and the reason why you and I will want to do that is because of the great love that the, our Lord has shown us. And because we love Him, we want to be like Him, and we want to follow Him. Again, that's what the Lord's table reminds us of this morning. So let's think about our lives in light of that. Whether or not we are actually conforming to the Word of God and doing what the Lord tells us He wants us to do, whether or not, particularly as we come to the table and also particularly as we think about the warning that is attached to the table, that if we come and eat and drink in an unworthy way, that we are guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. We have to be trusting Jesus, and we have to have that evidence in our lives of turning from our sins and walking in Him because we want to do it, not because somebody's forcing us to do it, not because we're in a society where People are going to look down on me if I don't, and I'm thinking about this society, not that one. So I conform to what people expect of me so that, uh, you know, that I'll, I'll at least be considered a Christian by others. No, the Lord is looking. The Lord knows that all-seeing eye. Uh, he discerns the thoughts and intents of the heart. There's nothing hidden from Him. Uh, what does the Lord see? As we come to His table, that's what we need to be concerned about. So let's take just a couple of moments and let's, uh, let's bow in silent prayer and let's ask the Lord to examine our hearts in that regard as we prepare to come to the table. But again, knowing that if we believe on the Lord Jesus, if we're really His, that's what we want to do and that's what we're seeking to do. Let's remember that there's a blessing here as well from the Lord um, to all who will 
receive these things in faith, the Lord will, will bless us and He will fill us with more of His Spirit so that we'll desire these things even more strongly. Let's spend a few moments in prayer.